The deadliest mass shooting in the history of the United States. 58 people murdered. Almost 500 others shot and injured or trampled upon. Thousands others traumatized in an entire nation once again in shock. Since 1776, there has never been in the history of this nation a deadlier mass shooting. This is now a part of our legacy. Last weekend is now a part of our legacy. And if you're anything like me, when you woke up on Monday morning to this news, and you heard the replaying and seeing kind of the recorded videos of this event and hearing bullets spraying from 400 yards away into a crowd of innocent people, if you were anything like me on Monday morning, one of the questions you were asking was, where was God? Why did not God do something to prevent this? Couldn't he have intervened? It is an important question to ask. And it's equally important that we listen to the answer to that question. Because this also has to do with our legacy. Guys, God has done something. God did do something. He continues to do and do and do more for us. And to answer that question precisely, we can look to the gospel this weekend and it gives us a very revealing answer. In the gospel, we hear this parable about this owner of a vineyard who left on a trip and leased his vineyard to some tenants to produce and give over that fruit at the proper time. And so when the vineyard owner sends his servants What do the tenants do? They kill the servants. And the vineyard owner doesn't stop. He sends even more servants to help. And what do they do? They kill those servants. And the vineyard owner then says to himself, I will send my son because, well, they'll respect him. He's my son. And so he sends his son. And what do they do? They kill the son. And our Lord has done the same for us. All of us. He continues to send us help. He continues to send intervention. But how? First, each of us has been sent a guardian angel. In fact, this past Monday, we celebrated the feast of our guardian angels. And this isn't just some fairy tale that we tell children when they are scared. This is a truth that is well-founded in Scripture that we have guardian angels assigned to each of us. In fact, in the Catechism, paragraph 336, it has this to say about guardian angels. From its beginning until death, human life is surrounded by their watchful care 
and intercession. Beside each believer stands an angel as protector and shepherd, leading him to eternal life. Each of us has been sent a servant of God, a guardian angel, to protect us not necessarily from earthly harm, but to protect us for eternity, to watch over and shepherd us for eternal life, the most important life, the life that we all hope to live, the life that we try to live right now. He has sent us angels. At our conception, He sends us and makes us with a conscience. He sends us angels and He sends us and creates us with a conscience. And our catechism has this to say about conscience. Deep within his conscience, man discovers a law which he has not laid upon himself, but which he must obey. Its voice ever calling him to love and to do what is good and to avoid evil sounds in his heart at the right moment. For man has in his heart a law inscribed by God. His conscience is man's most secret core and sanctuary. There he is alone with God, whose voice echoes in his depths. There's two things our catechism tells us about conscience that God sends us with our conscience. First, is that the law of God is written in us. This is not some kind of external law or statute written on a city or state or federal ordinance. This is a law that is literally a part of our DNA. It is written in us, thou shall not kill. We don't need a law outside of us to tell us this. God made us with this law. And then he gives us a voice within us, his own voice. He sends us his own voice that in the right moment, our catechism says, in the right moment, that voice tells us what to do and what to avoid. We have been made with this from the moment of our conception. And that conscience is still with us. He sends us angels. He sends us conscience. But as we know, we are fallen creatures. We are prone to make mistakes. We are prone to sin. We are prone to fail. And for this reason, He gives us grace upon grace upon grace. Actual grace. To help us. It is an external force that He sends us as if a good friend is. A good friend is there outside of us challenging us and pushing us, sometimes shoving us, kicking us in the rear end to do what is right, to help us do what is right, to avoid what is wrong, and to help us avoid what is wrong. He sends us His grace to help us obey our conscience, that voice and that law that are written deep within us. And then as if this weren't enough, our Lord thinks to Himself, I will send them My Son. They will respect Him. And God does. Every single Mass, we hear the voice of our Lord proclaimed in the Word, and we receive our Lord physically into our life in the Eucharist at every single Mass. God is consistently sending us His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in the Eucharist. And as St. John Paul II once said, in that tiny little host, in that tiny little host is contained the solution to all the world's problems. 
that tiny little host that is unconditional love, that is unconditional mercy, that is sacrifice, that is divinity in the midst of humanity, that is divinity overtaking humanity and becoming and uniting itself to us in that tiny little host is the solution to all the world's problems. This is what our God does. This is His intervention. That He sends every single person that He has ever created, He sends them an angel to guard and protect them for eternal life. He sends them a conscience in which our Lord speaks to us. He sends them grace upon grace in aid and help to push us in the right direction. And He sends us His Son, guys. He sends us Jesus Christ. And we are left, every one of us, to make the same decision that the tenants make in today's gospel. We are left with that same choice. We are left with the same choice of the Stephen Paddocks of the world who decide to commit murder. We can either reject and ignore our guardian angels. We can kill our consciences as the tenants do. We can kill and not respond to grace. And we can outright reject our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Or we can acknowledge with gratitude that we are surrounded, surrounded by angelic beings watching, guiding, and protecting us for eternal life. We can listen to our well-formed consciences. We can hear and understand and know the law of God because it's not something we have to go out and read about. It's written into us. And we can listen to that voice of God as it speaks to us about that law in the right moment. We can respond to grace in that help just as we respond and listen to good friends and those that truly care for us. And we can actually set out to live as His Son lives. It's a good question to ask. What could God have done? How could He have intervened? But maybe a better question to ask on this Sunday is what more could God have done? What more really could He have sent to us that He has not already given to us over and over and over again?